Our first guest has has been, has been a cult icon and pinup for over 30 years. Beginning with Brian De Palma's Carrie, she's been a part of some of the most memorable cult and pop culture touchstones of the past 30 years. In Halloween, she played Linda, the perky cheerleader who was totally preoccupied with making out with her boyfriend, Bob. She she would achieve she would follow up Halloween with change of pace performances and quirky character pieces like old boyfriends and breaking away. She would achieve near immortality as Riff Randall, Vince Lombardi High School's most rebellious student, and Alan Arkush's Ramones and Fun Teen Comedy Rock and Roll High School. Other highlights include Private Benjamin, Stripes, Sweet Dreams, Shake, Rattle, and Rock, Jawbreaker, and Rob Zombie's The Devil's Rejects. Tonight, she joins us to discuss her contribution to a horror movie classic. It is my pleasure to welcome PJ Souls to Back by Midnight. Hello. Hello. I'm so happy to be on Back by Midnight, although it's a little earlier here in California. (laughs) The sun is still out. Yeah, it was a little, it's a little early here in Texas also, but, but not as uh, scary yet. Not as scary. <laughs> that yet. was great that you played the music. Who does not know that theme? I mean, if you played you know, that to anybody, no matter what age, they'd probably be able to say Halloween. <laughs> yeah, it it, it it still remains, uh, for my money, my uh, probably next to the Psycho theme. It's my all-time favorite horror score. Uh, yeah. I just think it's always been remarkable. <laughs> but but let let let's before we get to Halloween, what what got you into acting? Because I I saw because um, obviously I guess Carrie was your first uh, big title, but you had done some work uh, up, uh, about for five or six years before that uh, in TV movies and so forth. And, and well, TV actually, shows. Carrie was my first big film. With, before that, I was living in Manhattan, and I had uh, been on a soap opera, um, right. that was a many splendor thing, and I had. Uh, been doing modeling and a lot of commercials. I did a lot of commercials in the early 70s. Mm-hmm. And um, I did a, a short film called Zebra that we shot out on Block Island. But when I came to uh, California in 1975 in Los Angeles, because I realized I didn't really want to be on Broadway, I was more of a movie actress than a Broadway actress because I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I didn't hang out late. I had to get up, I felt like getting up early. So <laughs> I decided uh, I'd head out to LA and uh, I was in that big casting session that everyone's heard about now. I've said it a million times of uh, right. Brian De Palma and George Lucas. He was uh, casting Star Wars. Brian was looking for any teenager in town for Carrie, and uh, they saw, you know, about uh, 100 a day, and I was in that long line. And uh, mm-hmm. when I walked in the room, Brian looked at George and said, I'll put her on my list. And so then we got called back for callbacks just to Brian's uh, place. So that's how that started. But how I got started in acting, I was actually in – school plays. I lived all over the world. Um, my dad was with an insurance company. He opened up all their branch offices worldwide. I was born in Germany. I lived in Morocco and Casablanca. I lived in Maracaibo, Venezuela. I went to high school in Brussels, Belgium. I came to New York State to go to, to college where my parents moved to Turkey, to Istanbul. And my roommate was from Manhattan. So we would take the train in uh, on the weekends. And then in the summer, since my parents were still in Istanbul and I didn't want to go there for the summer, I hung out with my friend Lorraine and uh, happened to pass by the actor's studio one day. They were looking for someone to do the lead spot uh, light on a production with Joanna Miles and Scott Glenn, it turned out, and uh, I applied for the job in exchange. They didn't pay money, but they paid uh, in, you could audit classes. So obviously they were looking for somebody that was thinking of acting. And like I said, in all these strange countries, I'd always gone to international or American schools and always had been in plays. And it was just something that was just I did for fun. And <laughs> so I was there doing the lead spot, and I, I met a guy afterwards called Josh White. He did the Joshua White show at the Fillmore East. And um, he said, you know, my sister's an actress, and I think you can make some money over the summer by doing commercials. I'll introduce you to Lester Lewis. And that's how it all started. And, uh, you know, I, I, I toyed with the idea of sticking around and not going back to college. I think I went back for a month and then... I was just making so much money and having so much fun, I decided, okay, this is for me. <laughs> I didn't know you could do this. <laughs> so uh, you do carry, and uh, you have one of the memorable, one of the many memorable death scenes. 
thanks to the red uh, the red baseball cap, which I actually wore to the audition. And mm-hmm. as I was turning around to leave, Brian said, bring that to the set. And I went, the hat? And he went, yes, the hat. And then when I showed up on the set and I didn't have, I did have the hat, but it was in my dressing room. And he looked at me and he goes, where's the hat? And I went, okay, I'll get the hat. <laughs> and then when I put my prom dress on, he goes, where's the hat? And I said, you want me to wear it for the prom? He goes, yes, Norma always wears her hat. <laughs> And, of course, uh, the famous story, uh, your accident on Carrie. Uh, oh, yes, with the fire hose. Well, the fire that was, hose. You know, the, Brian kind of planned everybody's, uh, all the uh, characters' deaths, the, the, you know, the hour before. So we're all in suspense as to what was going to happen, and mine was with the fire hose batting my head around and supposedly throwing me against the bleacher and breaking my neck. But the fire chief didn't want to man the hose. He said the stream was too powerful, and... Dick Zyker, the stunt coordinator, said, well, I'll do it. And uh, none of us realized how powerful a fire hose is. Thank goodness it is because of all the recent fires here in L.A. Um, So it's a good thing. But when you're working with it on your face, it was just a little too strong, and it went in my ear and broke my eardrum, and I just uh, immediately fell to the floor because I guess it – when you break your eardrum, you lose your equilibrium, and I just kind of slid to the floor. But that actual moment is on screen because, right. um, you know, it's the moment. Couldn't do a second turns. take on that. And so, uh, you know, that was <laughs> how, a painful if, end to to yeah. Norma and to PJ as well. <laughs> right. I'm just just for my because I, I I've had a long history of, of of ear problems. How long does it take for an eardrum to heal? It took about six months, and I went in every other week for shots. I have no idea what they were, but, uh, you know, it. Uh, I certainly don't have any problem with hearing. Right. So <laughs> that's a good thing. Everybody tells me, my kids, I, I hear too well. So <laughs> it didn't affect me, and so I'm grateful for that. But everybody no, loved I, Norma because she was just <laughs> kind of the nicer girl between the two, of, you know, me and Nancy Allen. And Nancy right. really was a, a bad girl, and I was just kind of the follower. But, uh <laughs> You know, Carrie had it out for me too, I guess, because I did laugh at her. <laughs> well, no, and, and then you follow this up. Uh, some people may not know this, but you also, uh, uh, John Travolta was in Carrie, and he was, you you also had a bit a part in uh, Boy in a Plastic Bubble. Right. right. I actually did my screen test uh, for Carrie with John Travolta because I was trying out for Nancy Allen's part. Right. Um, Amy Irving was trying out for Sissy Spacek's part. So everybody was trying out for different parts. Jack Fisk, who was the set designer, had already had the job of the set designer, and he kept pleading with Brian De Palma to to get Sissy in um, for him to see her. And he was like, no, no, no. But the day of the screen test, I guess he permitted Sissy to, okay, go ahead, you know, do your screen test. And then she just blew them all away. So, mm-hmm. And then, you know, it ended up where um, I got to be Norma, who actually only had one line in the film at the, at the opening of the movie in the volleyball court when I say, thanks, Carrie, and I whack my hat on on her he- head, and one of my right. pins got stuck in her hair, and I yanked it out. And at Daly's, everybody was just laughing hysterically. And I was only signed on for two weeks, but after that, he called my Brian De Palma, called my agent, and said she's on for the whole shoot, and we're gonna just give her bits, parts, and throw her in wherever. So wherever you see me, I was just thrown in, and none of that was ever scripted. <laughs> and so that so, turned out oh, to be fortuitous. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's good, good, uh, good thing yeah, you had so that. Yeah, and, and John and I had become friends, as he was friends with everybody on the set of Carrie. He was very childlike and skipped around mm-hmm. the set, and we all had a lot of fun with him. And when he was doing The Boy in the Plastic Bubble, he was my biggest supporter, like I said, when we would watch the dailies um, from Carrie, which is unusual, but Brian encouraged us to go and to make a big party of it every every night after work. And uh, John Travolta was just totally, you know, hysterical every time I came on the screen. So when he had a chance to throw me in as one of the students in his movie of the week, you know, I was delighted and uh, mm-hmm. had a great time. And uh, from what from what I understand is that uh, uh, John Carpenter was a fan of Carrie and was a fan of yours, and that he wrote Linda specifically for you. Is that true? Um, I didn't hear that until way after, like maybe about 10 years ago. I guess, you know, he's done enough interviews where that kind of information came out. He didn't tell me that. I went on an audition like everybody else. But he did, um, you know, he did have me read a scene, and I read it. And afterwards he said to me, why, you're the only one that has read that uh, scene and said the word totally the way I hear it. And I went, really? How else would you say it? And he said, I don't know, but you got the part. And so that's the first time. 
that a director in an off, a casting audition would, uh, you know, it's very unusual for them to tell you on the spot that you've got a jo- they got the job, they got the part, and then he asked me to stay and uh, help pick out my boyfriend, of which there were three choices. So <laughs> I stayed to pick out Bob. <laughs> but I was flattered after hearing that, and he certainly never told me that. But, uh, you know, uh, in, in those days, uh, if you were in a successful film, then – Everyone from the movies of the weeks and the series, uh, everybody, guest stars, guest leads, or movies, mm-hmm. you were on that list, the short list uh, for casting agents of uh, kids to be seen. So so that right. was very helpful to have been in Carrie. And uh, since we since you brought up the totally thing, which is now obviously <laughs> the catchphrase of, of Halloween, how, <laughs> how soon after... And easy to Halloween, sign on pictures, might I add. Everybody else has to write long things. I just write, totally. <laughs> well, well, I'm curious, how long after the success of Halloween did, did you, did that, people started coming up to you and you, you realized, oh, I have a, a catchphrase that I didn't know I was going to have? Too, was, uh, that took about a decade. I mean, really, it's a, it, you know, Halloween wasn't an overnight success. It took a long mm-hmm. time and that's why I guess that's what's called a cult movie. It, the same with Rock and Roll High School. That took forever for people to to realize, mm-hmm. wow, that's a really fun film. You know, it took the Ramones to, to be hugely successful for people to take another look and go, wow, that's a really campy, cute, you know, cult film. So the uh, same thing with uh, Totally. You know, people, I think, until it really got into the, the valley girl li- uh, lingo, <laughs> right. it wasn't, uh, you know, people wouldn't really come up to me and say anything. I, I got recognized more in New York. When you're walking around the streets in New York, people tend to go, hey, you're that, you know, but in L.A., right. you're in your car, and, and people don't really tend to, I don't go to any fancy restaurants, and I don't think, no, I don't go, I don't eat in Beverly Hills, so <laughs> I don't and get so, recognized much here. And so, as I, as I said in the intro, the thing about Halloween, what is interesting is that it, it is a a very, you know, it's an exercise in horror, but the horror kind of intrudes on this very kind of mundane very non-eventful, all-American setting, and so I was, I'm curious on the 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 opening. I guess the opening part of the film, where it's just uh, after school and, and girls are walking home. Uh, I'm curious how much. What was uh, Mr. Carpenter? What did, what did John Carpenter do to kind of encourage that camaraderie? Did he? I mean, that what create? How did that dynamic create that? that uh, you were kind of the perky one and Jamie Lee Curtis was kind of the shy one and so forth. And how did, did that come through rehearsals or is that just through improv or, or the script? I think or? probably uh, it was, uh, you know, the the characterizations of each individual girl probably was uh, written mostly mm-hmm. by Deborah Hill. I, I have heard and I know she talked to us before we were shooting um, and saying that she infused a lot of her experience into each character. And that's something that I notice uh, with our Halloween as opposed to Rob Zombie's reimagining where all the girls tend to have the same personality. And um, ours, you know, each girl had a distinct and, and separate and different um, personality. And I don't know if that's just uh, was typical 70s and uh, the girls in Rob Zombie's were, cur- you know, current day. And so they have right. more... Um, you know, fused personality, but um, it definitely was scripted because Annie was the one that, you know, had the boyfriend but still was the babysitter and had, you know, responsibility, but I was the one that was kind of the free the free and fun-loving one, and, you know, and uh, Jamie was friends with us as always will be one girl that's hoping to, you know, right. be a part of a group that is more of the fun girls, and that's based on my personal experience, too. I I really was more like uh, like Jamie Lee, like Lori in high school, and but I did have a friend, Cindy Clark, who was more like my character, who I kind of based, you know, uh, Linda on. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and, uh, Cindy Clark from Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and let, let's talk about your, I guess we can say, your two big set pieces in Halloween. Uh, obviously, one is the the uh, love scene that's kind of the uh, at the time is 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 interesting in the 70s that uh horror movies they kind of they were kind of just in uh, they weren't kind of enamored with sexuality let alone teen sexuality they kind of Halloween kind of starts that at that time and so uh obviously that obviously that scene was in the script what was uh what was it like approaching that cuz um was it was that uncomfortable or were you comfortable doing those that type of sequence because you 
if I remember, you're in the uh, opening shower scene. Am I, am I correct in Carrie? Are, are you in the? I was in the opening shower scene, but I was one of the few people that just had the uh, towel. Of, uh, oh. I came out of the shower and immediately put a towel up. So <laughs> I didn't walk out naked like all the other girls did. So, <laughs> I walked out so with, the, the, with the towel. All right. Well, so then <laughs> Halloween comes, and you do have a little uh, bit of nudity in it. And, uh, right, but that was, was not scripted. It, all it said in the script was that, you know, Linda and Bob go upstairs. And, mm-hmm. But John did want something, and so that whole sequence was imp- improvised, and uh, and it was only Dean Cundy and John in the room, and John was more nervous than I was, and I was, you know, willing to do whatever to to uh, make the scene have a little bit of a comedic uh, 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 scent to it, and uh, you know, we basically just he was gonna shoot us just in the bed, and then he didn't really know what to do after that. And mm-hmm. so we came up with the beer, saying, go get me a beer. And, you know, and then the fact that, well, he's got to come back up but with the sheet over. And so all of that kind of was just thought up uh, right there, then and there. And, uh, you know. Well, the best, the best touch though, is obviously the, the glasses. On, uh, I'm sorry? The best touch is obviously the glasses. Uh, right. That was hilarious. And uh, that was really, you know, definitely not scripted. And uh, he was just breathing, and then all John said to me was, you've got to entice him and get him, you know, to get back in bed, because you have no idea. The audience knows, but you don't know. And, uh, you know, I reached into my purse and took out a nail file, because I didn't know what else to do, and uh, that worked. And uh, and then he said, you, you want to tease him and try to do something, so that's when, you know, I put the sheet down and say, see anything you like, and he didn't respond, and so... It's obviously, you know, works because the audience knows who he is. I don't, and I'm trying everything I can to get him to come back, you know, where's my beer, yeah. come back into bed, and he's not. So, And so then the other direction was, okay, and then you get out of bed and you t- you call uh, you, you call Lori, you know. So, mm-hmm. you know, John was a little bit more nervous. He said, whatever you want to do, however much, however little, you know, we just mm-hmm. want you to be sexy and just try to entice Bob to come back into bed, and it's not – you know, going anywhere, and that's why my line is, this is going nowhere. You know, he definitely <laughs> said, you know, asked me to say that, so. Well, and then the other half of the sequence, uh, what does it take to, you have to, uh, obviously you know ahead of time that the person, I, I guess, I believe it's Nick Castle playing the, the shape, is right. going to come up behind you and start strangling you, and you have to act like you're going to be startled, but I'll, but you are, uh, how do how do you, how did you prep yourself to make sure you didn't give away that you're bracing yourself? Um, um, well, one, Nick Castle was very gentle. In fact, we had to stop a few times because he was tickling my throat, and he would, you know, come up sort of gently, and uh, you know, he was he was just obviously didn't want to hurt anybody. And, but you know, there wasn't really any way he would. But in those instances, you just put it out of your mind and you wait for the moment to happen. You know, I mean, I just. I believe in realistic acting, and I just, you know, turn my back, I'm talking on the phone, and whenever I would, you know, whenever he would come up, I wasn't anticipating him because I didn't expect it in my in my mind, you know. Right. So you, you don't really brace yourself because, one, I knew I wasn't going to get hurt, we're acting. <laughs> and two, you know, it's it's not a horror movie when you're filming it. It's, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's work, so. <laughs> right. But, and so, the mo- so that uh, that's the last of Linda. And so, so I had to work very hard at pretending to be choking because right. he hardly, you know, put any pressure on the phone cord. He didn't right. want to leave any marks. He didn't want to hurt me. And so, you know, that's why when I fell out of, uh, I sort of slid out of frame, I made sure to extend my death throttle because I just wanted to have a little bit, you know, to let everyone know that it's taking a little bit longer, you know. It's not it's not easy to kill Linda here. So, And I wanted a little bit more screen time, so I just kept going, <laughs> Right. <laughs> it, so when when did you uh, first see a, a a rough cut, or did you, or did you see it on an opening night type of situation? Um, well, they ha- always have cast and crew screenings first, right. and so we we all went to that, and uh, we saw it, and I was delighted. I just thought it was really great. Um, it was nothing that I thought, oh my gosh, this is gonna, you know, be a box office smash, and people are gonna just go crazy for this movie because. For us, it was still a small movie. You know, I mean, Carrie was a small movie in my book, and yet it had a, a, a huge but. You know, it was like a million dollars, a million dollar mm-hmm. budget, which was big. This was a three hundred thousand dollar budget, which a hundred of it went to Donald Pleasant. So you're talking <laughs> a two hundred thousand dollar budget. So 
um, you know, we all just, but, but when we heard it with the music, it was just spectacular, and I had no idea that, you know, John was so talented in terms mm-hmm. of uh, of pulling that off. And I love the opening titles with the with the candle and the and the pumpkin and everyone's credits. And I just thought they did a, a fantastic job. And uh, John and Deborah Hill, you know, it was really a labor of love. And and mm-hmm. uh, and they did it by thrilling people and not by you know all this unnecessary gore that you always see <laughs> in the right. in the movies that were to follow. Well, I'm uh, before I ask. Uh, Move on on to a couple of later things. I, I, I got to. You didn't have any scenes with him, but did you ever get to meet Donald Pleasant? Um, yes, we were always we were all there every day because of it being such a short shoot and being mm-hmm. in different locations and being kind of a shoot off the cuff. Uh, you know, maybe Dean Cundy would say, well, they had some plans. Obviously, you know, you bring in the camera and the and the crew, but really, it was such a small crew and cast. That we were there every day, and you never knew when somebody was going to be needed for something somewhere, and uh, and so we were always around. And uh, you know, Jamie and, and Nancy and I would always had lunch with Donald Pleasance. He kind of kept to himself. I think he he might have had a trailer. I don't remember quite. Yeah, I think the three of us shared a trailer with the costume, with wardrobe and makeup. But, and then Donald might have had his own, but it, definitely at lunch we would sit there. But he kind of remained in character uh, is what I remember, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, he didn't want to get too friendly with us because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I think he wanted to just maintain his his sense of who he was playing because he right. definitely <laughs> had a very interesting take on Dr. Loomis. <laughs> well, and like um, as people know, the, the film uh, opened on a screen in Kansas City and uh, it slowly started building, and then uh, bad reviews came in. But then a Village Voice rave came in, and then actually uh, um, Siskel and Ebert came in and raved at the time. Right. Uh, you know, Roger Ebert called it the best thing since Psycho, and then it just started. Yeah, it's uh, on the back of this box set. It's it got his quote here: an "Absolutely yeah. merciless thriller." I'd like right. to be clear about this. If you don't want to have a really terrifying experience, don't see Halloween. <laughs> And so okay. when when did you uh started like noticing that it was trickling in that people were actually that people had seen it and, and it was It took about it, a year. I would say it took about a year. Yeah. But in the industry, like I said, again, for casting mm-hmm. purposes, you know, people were aware that you had, you know, mm-hmm. done a good scene like that and so I was able to, you know, get seen for other movies because of that, and that's probably, you know, mm-hmm. obviously why Rock and Roll High School came my way, because Alan Arkish had seen Halloween, and in those days, it wasn't the teen uh, mania that uh, is today with reality shows and, mm-hmm. you know, all those, uh, Beverly Hills 90210, and all, none of those shows existed, and so, you know, you picked teens from your little pool of um, movies and small parts, and, and then you tried to get them on TV or whatever, but... It wasn't like what is happening today, where there's a million teen actors out there and and reality actors too. Right. So. Well, I want to ask about Rock and Roll High School, but first I want to ask about a film that uh, I don't think people know much about, and they uh, it's it's always whenever it's brought up, it, it kind of gets mentioned in passing, and that is Old, Old Boyfriend, which uh, is a underrated film and an underrated film directed by uh, a woman, uh, Joan June Tewksbury, yeah. Tewksbury of who wrote Nashville for Robert Altman and just right. terrific. And so, and you had a, a, a bit part in that and, you know, that's, uh, you know, a tiny little part. I think I was cast because I looked yeah. in the bathing suit. <laughs> yeah. And that was but, even before Carrie had come out. I think I had filmed Carrie and then I yeah. went up on different auditions and that was just one that I got and I, I mm-hmm. liked talking with her and she was a nice, bright woman. And, but it was a very, you know, for my, for my end, a very kind of silly, part just yeah. jumping in the water and getting out of this kind of eye candy I suppose so yeah. it wasn't really a fulfilling role but I thought it was a good movie <laughs> and this, was that the uh, and, and what about uh, I guess before I get to Rodman High School uh, Breaking Away what was the and Breaking Away right well yeah. uh, before that I was in our winning season I think after right. my boyfriends and then right after Carrie um, in fact right after Carrie Carrie came out when we were actually shooting in Georgia we were in the uh, Mm-hmm. small town in Georgia, Noonan, Georgia, and filming um, our winning season that Joe Rubin directed. And um, that's where I met Dennis, Dennis Quaid. Mm-hmm. And 
you know, we started dating, and uh, that while we were shooting, it was an eight-week shoot, they uh, had a, an opening of a film there. It was Carrie, and so we all went down and took pictures of us standing under the marquee, and because the people in the small town knew I was filming there, they put Carrie starring P.J. Souls <laughs> on, the, on the marquee, so it was really cute. I have a, and they put in the newspaper, so I have that clipping from those days, and it's kind of sweet. But anyway, um, so after we returned, then... Um, Dennis got the opportunity to do Breaking Away, and I went with him. And uh, I tried to get the part of the French girl because I, I speak <laughs> French, and so I auditioned for Peter Gates with a black wig on. In fact, the, the wig I ended up using in Private Benjamin because Goldie didn't want anyone else to have blonde hair, so I had to, I had to fool them too. But in any event, when I auditioned for Breaking Away, he said, "No, no, no, that's P.J. That's you can't do that part. You're not French." <laughs> and they ended up getting this. Uh, blonde girl but anyway she was cute and she was good in it but I didn't have a, a bit part as one of Hart Boxner who played Rod the college kid I was one of his kind of girly girl cheerleader girls you know wherever mm -hmm. Rod went I was like yay Rod so <laughs> that was because I happened to be there I was there you know to support mm -hmm. Dennis and hang out with Dennis so well I got I gotta ask you about Rock Roll High School because uh it is now a, you know and obviously a uh, a part of Ramones folklore, but right. at the time it was at the time it was made, the Ramones weren't really uh, what they are now. They, uh, you know, it was kind of yeah, a, they were just kind of breaking. It was an under it was an underground thing that you shared. If you liked the Ramones, you were you knew something that most people most people didn't. Right, uh, and I think Alan Arkish was aware of them, but I don't think anybody else, including myself, was really <laughs> quite aware of of who they were or what they were, were to become. That's for sure. Well, what is your most, uh, I guess you can say, indelible memory of making Rock and Roll High School? Is it performing with the Ramones or one of the other bits in the film? What, what, what is, what's the one memory that Well, I when I look back at? on it now um, and I think about it, uh, I'm amazed that the first day of shooting, the actual first day, was the romantic scene in the bedroom when I'm imagining that they're in my room. And mm -hmm. I always think when I see that scene, that was pretty amazing given that, you know, the Ramones were very nervous. They loved Roger Corman films, especially Johnny. Um, they were a little uh, uptight to be on camera and to be acting because they didn't know what they were going to do. They were totally comfortable in all the the scenes where they're you know playing at the Roxy and on stage, but to actually be filmed, they they didn't quite know what to do. And but that was the endearing and great part about them, you know. But uh, when I think back, that that day was. Uh, you know, was really memorable because I had listened to the cassette. Remember in those days, <laughs> cassettes, and I just ran around the house going, "What are these people? Who are these people? This is a horrible sound. I have to be their number one fan. How am I going to do this?" Ah! <laughs> and then, uh, you know, of course, it's called acting. And so mm -hmm. the day I went to the set, I didn't know what to expect. And there's uh, Joey leaning over me, and I'm in my, you know, bra and panties, and he's singing into my mouth and spitting in my mouth. <laughs> I'm going, "What is this?" <laughs> But it's the cutest scene, and it's really sweet. And uh, they were just the nicest guys and very humble and uh, a little awkward. And they did have about 20 uh, pages of dialogue that other scenes, short scenes with little bits mm -hmm. for each of them that we had to cut out because they just, uh, they, I don't know, they just, <laughs> they're <laughs> they're a punk band. They're not actors, but right. it's their hard day's night. And I think it's an, a great movie, and it's you can watch it over and over again. And... I just think it's hilarious, and I'm I'm so glad that we did it. And I heard for years and years that Johnny, you know, was upset about it, and he didn't think that, you know, it showed them, uh, you know, in the the dark light of punctum that I guess that they wanted to represent. But uh, mm -hmm. I think he got over that, and we we luckily got to meet right a couple months before he passed away because I mm -hmm. was in the had a small part in the Devil's Rejects, and Rob Zombie had a little ga gathering at his house, and Johnny was there, and. I got to see him and hug him and say, "Hey, come on, you know we're gonna live forever in in rock in the movie Rock and Roll High School." So, you know, don't put it down. <laughs> Be proud well, of it. it. No, and that, but also, and uh, Joey, he had a, if I if I know my Ramones folklore, he he had more of a he more of an appreciation for the uh, I guess you could say the pop sound of the Rock and Roll High School soundtrack than the I guess you could say the harder sound that uh, you know that was kind of the other half of their sound. It was kind of that right. heart the driving. And then, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that's what makes that band the perfect choice because yeah. we end up blowing up the high school in the end and we were rebelling against, you know, right. Togar who didn't want us to play that kind of music and we were, you know, striving for uh, teen rights. And so mm-hmm. they were the they were the perfect band, you know. Is it true? Down I, I, the, come is down it the true road in that pink Cadillac, it's, it's, right. uh, that's a great scene. Is it true I read that you actually uh uh, introduced them or performed with them uh, at a concert at one point? Is that at the Roxy one, yeah, when they came. Oh, like, wow. I think it was about a year later after we had uh, after the movie had been out, and so I <laughs> went to see them, and cause we kind of stayed in touch off and on. Now I'm more in touch, or have been, not lately, but with uh, Joey's brother, Mickey Lee, but, you know, that's mm-hmm. because of everybody doing benefits for lymphoma and prostate cancer right. and all of that. So And, and um, Linda Ramone, every... Every summer in August, she puts on the Rock and Roll High School screening at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. They show it on the mausoleum wall, and people come and, and sit around the headstones, and they bring out the pink Cadillac, and only Marky and I now, we sit in the pink Cadillac, and the fans take pictures, and it's really a hoot and fun. <laughs> and they have different people that speak about, you know, so, the good old so, days. Yeah. Well, so what are, what are you, uh, you, you, what are you doing now? Uh, I remember I was, uh, I, 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 uh, I remember... Uh, seeing uh, being when I was younger, the shake rattle, uh, shake rattle and rock was on Showtime, and that right, was Alan great... Arkus directed that, and that was Renee Zellweger's first movie, and she was awesome, and it was just yeah. terrific. And you, and the little Me and trivia... I and Jay Young and Mary Warren right. off and I together, <laughs> that was really fun. <laughs> right, and and the little inside joke is that you're playing, I, I believe, Riff Randall's mother, uh, <laughs> uh, in that, which is kind of fun for anyone who knows the, the, the lineage there. Uh and so, so but uh what do you what have you been up to uh uh now I, uh it was it was I guess it was the what was it what was the Devil's Rejects uh, experience like with Rob Zombie? That was fun. There was a call for notable uh 70s actors for cameo for cameos in this movie. Mm-hmm. So um, um you know these days you go out, uh, out to a place and uh, usually a gal or guy with a video camera is there and you you know, slate your name and do a scene on camera, and you hear from them three months later, which is what exactly what happened. Although I knew it was Rob Zombie, um, I had heard about him. I didn't really know him that well in terms mm-hmm. of his music or anything else, but I had signed a picture of me from Carrie with my red baseball hat because I had heard that uh, you know he liked uh, Carrie and, and Halloween, and mm-hmm. I wrote on there, "I'm ready to scream for you." So hopefully that's, that's what did the trick and. Uh, he, uh, I heard three months later that they wanted me for that small scene, but it was a lot of fun. And uh, I brought him the local H CD of whatever happened to PJ Souls, and the whole day he kept playing that song <laughs> whenever we'd have a break. So it was really fun. So then that kind of, you know, I had done a lot of movies, and then I'd gotten married again. Uh, Dennis and I had divorced, but then I had gotten married um and had two children, and you know it takes a lot to to be a mom. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to dedicate my time to my kids, but I did I did work in you know some things. I was in Cheers and a bunch of television things, and here and there small things. But I wanted to concentrate you know on raising my kids, and and then uh, you know now they're grown up. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and my my daughter's in college, my son's in the Coast Guard, and uh, and so now I've been you know doing other projects, and that was certainly one that put me on the map again and and on uh, you know the horror the horror scene map so after that i was asked to appear at a bunch of conventions around the country which i really like i mean i love meeting the fans they're always so nice they love halloween especially and then when they remember oh my gosh you were in rock and high school oh my god you were in stripes oh gosh she's the one from carrie it's just so nice and uh, very fulfilling for me so i've been doing that and doing uh, small films i'm in a short film called beg that mm-hmm. Tony Todd just completed uh, filming a small part in, and Tony Moran and I play husband and wife in it. It's kind of a, a you know, a thriller chiller, but a short <laughs> film. But and then another film that I just uh, finished, uh, I did a, a part in uh, in Columbus, Ohio. And um, let's see, what is that called? Is that Prank? Is that Eternal. Prank? It's called oh, Eternal, Eternal. Yeah, with the young director Derek Rimmelsbach, who. Mm-hmm. It's just terrific, and uh, I think it's going to be really good. And I'm the the old witch in the beginning that makes the young boy become immortal by my spell. Okay. <laughs> and uh, like I, said, I also saw the. Oh, yeah, and I was in the Tooth Fairy, and you know, I went up to mm-hmm. Canada and did that. 
So yeah. you know, I'd like to I'd like to do more comedies, but people keep uh, putting me in this horror slot. But I am supposed to also direct a a movie and a series of films called Prank that Tony Nassi, who was one of the producers of the 25 Years of uh, Terror, the Halloween right. documentary, um, he's putting together and his idea is to get screen queens to direct short films and and um, Danielle Harris just completed and show, showed her 18-minute um, film at uh, the Screen Fest here in L.A., and, and it was really, really good. And our friend John Corliss did the music, and it was just terrific. So that's the first one, and then I think Heather Langenkamp and Ellie Cornell are supposed to do two and three, and once those are done, then I'm in the second set. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. And so when, when is that going to start filming? Um, um, well, they have to do uh, Heather's and Ellie's, and mm-hmm. uh, although Tony said after the screen, he said, maybe we'll squeeze in a fourth <laughs> and have <laughs> you do. And I said, that would be great, because I already have my writer. Uh, Matt Russell has already written my script, and we're good to go, and we're pretty much ready, but uh, we have to wait and see when our, our position is. And, of course, always mm-hmm. financing is an issue, so mm-hmm. we're hoping to do that, but that's called prank, and uh, you know we're going to do the three or the four, and that's right. Will will make it, uh, you know, long enough to be a feature film, so. Well, that that's all sounds good, and, uh... Yeah. W- well, I want to... And, you know, I always you. toy with the idea of writing my autobiography, so that's something oh. I've been offered, you know, please do this, do that, so I keep right. thinking, okay, I'm going to write the Totally Girl, and uh, <laughs> I'll write about my life in Hollywood, and before, because, you know, like I said, I grew up around the world, and it was a very interesting childhood, but all the girls and teen- American teenagers that I've played... Is everything I didn't get to be when I grew up, so I guess <laughs> I got to be it anyway. But when I was a little older. <laughs> well, if you uh, uh, if you do finally get around to writing your autobiography, will you come back and talk to us about it? Absolutely, that, that'll absolutely. Be, that'll be terrific. Well, I want to thank you for <laughs> I want to thank you for coming on the show and talking about uh, not only Halloween but uh, things life before and after. Uh, so I really want to thank you for for spending this time with us. Well, it was totally a pleasure. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and happy Halloween, and I, I hope everybody will go and get this. This is the cutest little box that has a little miniature yeah. Michael Myers mask, and there's a really nice picture of uh, of John Carpenter with uh, you know on the set of when Bob and I are in bed with the the lit up pumpkin. It's a really nice picture that they put on the box, and then in the back when we're in the van, I, I love that picture. It's and a terrific uh, set. It's got a it lot really of is. Blu-ray mm. edition and uh, four and five are in there. And yeah. The extended That's cut. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I think enough already, though. 30th anniversary. I hope there's not yeah. going to be a 35th and a 40th. I think it's <laughs> enough already. <laughs> well, uh, like I said, well, I want to thank you for coming on. It's been it's been a blast. I wish we could go oh. on for more. Well, uh, you're welcome. Happy Halloween. <laughs> happy Halloween. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. He is one of the great cinematographers of the last 30 years. He cut his teeth on exploitation pictures like Black Shampoo and Satan's Cheerleaders. Beginning with Halloween, he would form a five-movie relationship with John Carpenter. His early innovative use of the Panaglide camera in establishing the point of view of key characters was an upsetting experience in a, in a horror movie. Taking a cue from Gordon Willis's stalk and walk technique from Clute, the audience's culpability in a killer's deeds would set a new standard for horror suspense movies in the years to come. His other collaborations with John Carpenter include The Fog, Escape from New York, where he would perfect his blue-tinted nighttime moodiness, The Thing, and Big Trouble in Little China. He would go on to collaborate with directors like Robert Zemeckis on Romancing the Stone, the Back to the Future trilogy, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which earned him an Oscar nomination, with Steven Spielberg on Hook and Jurassic Park, and with Ron Howard on Apollo 13. In conjunction with the recent release of a 30th anniversary commemorative box set of Halloween, it is my pleasure to welcome world-class cinematographer Dean Cundy to Back by Midnight. Mr. Cundy? Mr. Cundy? Hello? I 
think he can hear me, uh, but I can't hear him. If he can hear me, maybe he can call in again and we can get a proper connection. Let me try this again. Mr. Cundy, are you there? Okay. Uh, I cannot hear Mr. Dean Cundy. Uh, the switchboard shows that he is on the line, but I cannot hear him. So if he can hear me, maybe uh, he can call back into the show, on, into the switchboard, and we can get a proper connection. Uh, so that, that would probably be the best thing. So let, let us see. I think he's going to try to call back, and we'll get a proper connection. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let me continue on what's coming up on the weeks ahead of Back by Midnight. On November 11th and 13th, we will be having a two-part blowout tribute to the Sopranos. Uh, hold on, I think Mr. Cundy's back. Let's see. Hello there. Hello, Mr. Hello. Cundy. There we are. Hello. Howdy. Ah, very good. Very good. I could hear you, but you couldn't could, hear me. I could not hear you. That was my that was my fault. Uh, so uh, glad glad you could uh, join us for this interview. Well, uh, thanks very much for the invitation. No, no problem. So I I gotta ask before we get into the to the Halloween and Carpenter stuff. Um, I was looking at your credits, and I, this is a film I'd always heard about uh, during the uh, onslaught of black exploitation movies. But you were the cinematographer on Black Shampoo. This is yeah, actually, um, that was almost one of my first movies, and and um, one of the movies that. Uh, Sort of gave me the first opportunity. I was supposed to be the gaffer on on a, a movie, and the uh, the guy who was going to be the cinematographer. Uh, the second day we were shooting uh, was in a car accident, <clears throat> and while he survived, uh, wasn't able to uh, continue working. So the director gave me an opportunity to uh, shoot the movie, and it was really uh, sort of the the opportunity that got it all started for me. Mm -hmm. Well, it's one. It's, I always, uh, I've always heard the title uh, back when I guess, you know, studios were going nuts with black exploitation. They were taking any title and just basically adding the word black to it, uh, blackula, whatever. Uh, and so, black shampoo is always one of those infamous titles that you always read about if you don't uh, see that often. Uh, well, from there, I'm, I'm curious. So, how did you? Uh, get the uh, the job of being DP on Halloween? Well, I um, after Black Shampoo, uh, I, I did about four more films with the same director, and they were all uh, r really sort of uh, very low-budget exploitation films, uh, mm -hmm. car chases, uh, girls with machine guns, that kind of thing. Right. And it, uh, it gave me a chance to... Uh, sort of uh, be begin practicing my craft. Um, I had gone to UCLA Film School, but of course it isn't until you really uh, are pushed out and have to uh, start, you know, shooting and, and meeting a schedule and a budget and all that that you begin to learn. Um, so I did um, probably about 10 or 12 uh, very low-budget uh, films, some with the same uh, director, um, others with uh, different directors, but <coughs> excuse me. But um, I worked with Deborah Hill when she was a script supervisor on uh, about three or four of those films. And um, <coughs> one day she she told me that she had um, she worked in the past with John Carpenter, and then that she and uh, John were writing a, a low budget horror film and. And she thought that John and I would make a good team. Was I interested in meeting him? And I said, uh, well, sure, because, of course, any opportunity uh, to work was, was a good one. Mm -hmm. And um, so I met with John, and uh, we struck it off. Uh, you know, he seemed um, somehow different than the directors I'd been working with, and that, that proved to be true because um, the um, – the other directors, <laughs> even though they were working on low-budget films, were were more interested about just cranking out a product and getting it done. And uh, when when I began working with John, I realized uh, 
he was interested in something uh, more than what I had been experiencing, which is how to tell the story with the camera, how to draw the audience into the storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it turned out to be a great uh, experience and collaboration to work with somebody who um, was, was more in line with my sensibilities, which is you know, trying to, to uh, do something better with the project than sometimes you were, you were given as far as story and, and um, you know, facilities and all. And yeah. uh, so it it was a great uh, a great experience, and um, I think he realized that in me he had a kindred spirit of someone who was really interested in doing more than just um, cranking out a film, but somehow uh, you know drawing the audience into the film, and um, you know cr- creating the kind of filmmaking that. Um, you know, you, you kind of hope for and expect out of, uh, you know, good filmmakers and storytellers. Uh, and that is an experience for the audience that they come away having said, uh, well, I'm, I'm glad I did that. Well, uh, uh, well, let's talk about Halloween and that. Um, was that, was that your first time doing uh 235 scope uh, widescreen? Was that your first uh, use of that? Um, I, I'd actually done it uh, a couple times before um, because what, one of the things I always tried to do when I was working on a low-budget film was was challenge myself to do something different. Even even if the, the script was terrible, um, even if the actors were were you know much less than you had hoped, um, I always tried to do something uh, to 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 learn to use a new piece of equipment and. So I I, um, I can't remember, but one of the low budget films I had actually talked the uh, the producer into shooting it with the widescreen um, mm. two three five, and um, so it gave me a little bit of the experience. And uh, but but John's was the first um, first opportunity to do something with it. John understood the the use of it, the composition. Um, so uh, again, I had someone who, um, w- w- you know, if I made a suggestion or, um, you know, w- if we composed a a, uh, a shot, um, he understood the value of of uh, using the frame and using it as a storytelling tool. Now, uh, if I understand my my timeline correctly, I mean, this Halloween is obviously is it's two years before The Shining, and uh, the two big films before Halloween, uh, I think Bound for Glory and uh, the, uh, the Running Up the Steps and Rocky were the ones that, you know, started using the Steadicam. But Halloween has uh, is pretty innovative for being a low-budget film and using the Panaglide uh, kind of Steadicam. Uh, and uh, so what was that like, wanting to, to in, in employ that technique, which was still relatively new? Well, uh, like I said, I, I was always interested in something new, um, learning something, challenging myself, um, and the opportunity to use the Panaglide was was um, r- really something I welcomed, of course, and, and John uh, also um, r- immediately uh, recognized it for its its uh, value. You know, it it, it was a it's something that that when it first started out, it was something that um, was viewed as a way to replace a dolly. Um, and the first uh, people who used it um, didn't uh, necessarily say, well, how can we integrate the the look and the feel of, of the Panaglide of a Steadicam into the story? And John was very interested in, in doing that. And um, you know, as um, you know, as you can see from the very first shot in the uh, in the film, the one that uh, starts across the house and the street from the house um, goes around, goes inside, goes upstairs, comes downstairs. All of it um, <clears throat> not being uh, a, a shot that was just a moving camera, but 
uh, it was obviously uh, a character. It was, um, you know, and as we discovered, it was Michael Myers, the uh, <clears throat> the um, antagonist for the uh, whole movie. So, um, well, it, well, let's let's talk about that that scene because it's obviously the one of, if not the most famous scene in the film, and that it. Uh, Carpenter has said that obviously it, that it is uh, uh, inspired by the opening of of Touch of Evil, but this is a little different in that we've had like obviously you know POV shots for you know since the beginning of the film, but this was a little different in that this was a moving POV shot of a what we soon discover of a killer, so the audience is is kind of. Uh, unknowingly culpable in this deed and then the big reveal that it's a six-year-old boy and so i mean so it's a it's kind of a it's a obviously it's shocking in, in, in storytelling but it is a shocking uh use of camera and that it was very different and it really uh did so i'm curious did you know that at the time that you were kind of uh that this shot was kind of going to set a standard for horror suspense you know, kind of stalk and walk sequences. I mean, because it, it's obviously become now the the standard in any kind of horror suspense film to have these. Yeah, well, it it it, it the, at the time um, I had uh, you know practiced a little. As a matter of fact, the uh, that act, that shot was actually done by myself and by the camera operator Ray Stella, um, and we we alternated. So uh, I don't know who's take it was that actually ended up in the film um i always credit ray uh so that uh, mm -hmm. he gets the credit but um it was it, it was a shot that uh just by the nature of the way the camera moved you know people had been hand holding a camera putting it on their shoulders and walking with it for some time um but there was a particular feel to that uh you can always uh sort of sense the the, the steps, the, uh, the the footsteps of the camera operator and the way it, the camera moves back and forth. Um, the steady cam gave such a uh, a smooth floating feeling that it became uh, a little bit otherworldly um, for the first time. And um, so we we knew that we were giving the camera a completely different feeling. We were giving the audience a, a different perspective, point of view of um of of the story so we uh w you know that was something that we used very carefully um and um i don't know if anybody really realizes at the time when you're making a movie that you're going to make a classic everybody hopes mm -hmm. that the film will be well received um hopes that uh, an audience will go see it uh, hopefully a large audience will go see it um because that's that you know that's kind of the the ultimate reward for your efforts is to uh, have a lot of people see it and appreciate it but um uh, i um i i i'm always reminded of the after we had shot the film and mm -hmm. uh they were starting to get a little bit of press you know and the critics said um gee this is a film a lot better than one would expect and and of course it was the first of a new wave of of horror films, mm -hmm. but uh, a after the film had been out for about two or three weeks and started to get a little um, notice, um, John uh, was invited back to USC Film School, um, and uh, you know I, I went and Deborah went and and Tommy Lee, uh, you know went as the editor art director, um, and um, a couple of other people, and after the film was screened for a uh, in the student screening room for the one of the classes in the evening, uh, we all sat up on the stage and we answered questions. and And the interest was at that point uh, was the fact that here was a film student from SC, John, who had been successful in actually making a movie. Nobody really thought of Halloween other than just an opportunity for a film student to make a low-budget movie. And uh, what was our experience and how did we do it? And a lot of it was uh, aimed at uh, explaining 
to the all of the film students who were gathered in the audience um, the fact that uh, you know it was possible and to keep up your hope and and uh, how do you go about making the movie and so forth and um, uh, there was a, a hand uh, because we were answering questions and a, and a student got up and said now why did you make this movie why did you make a horror film and um, I remember Deborah answering saying that um, she had, uh, like like all of us, uh, realized it was an opportunity uh, just to make a movie, for for one, uh, which was valuable for starting filmmakers, but also that we all were interested and tried our best to do more than uh, we thought um, we, we might with the kind of budget and schedule we had, and somehow to, to produce a film that had uh, distinctive style, um, um, maybe would <clears throat> reach a, a new audience because it was was a different kind of um, you know subject matter for what it was being made, a whole different style, um, and that uh, we we hope to do something that 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 kind of for us would be a classic uh, film and a classic moment. And the student got up and said, "I can't. First of all, I can't believe you would make." this kind of a film um, and secondly the audacity of you people to think that this film has any potential to be a classic is ridiculous and he got up and walked out and we all looked at each other and said oh well uh, I I guess not maybe we overestimated this film <laughs> well now 30 years later right. here they are releasing um, the the classic boxed set of uh, the film that um, you know nobody thought would would ever be noticed. Well, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, going back to the to the stalk and walk uh, aspect of the film, and I, I'd mentioned it in my intro that uh, one of the earliest indicators, one of the earliest uses of this kind of POV uh, was in Clute, and I was wondering if you had if you were aware of that, of the, the, the use of that uh, shot in Clute, even, uh, even though Gordon Willis, because there was no panadolide, was a little more, was limited in it, and that this kind of was like uh, an extrapolation on the, the, the stalk and walk sequences of Clute. Um, well, we didn't, we didn't consciously refer to it. I know that uh, I watched a couple of films with uh, John. John was very, um, very influenced by um, some of the very classic filmmakers. Uh, Howard Hawks was one of his mm -hmm. favorites. He he loved the um, simple direct storytelling of Hawks and so forth. So um, while we had um, we'd looked at a few um, sort of moving cameras, um, I don't think we necessarily referenced uh, Clute, but um, it, uh, we were at a time when um, a different kind of moving camera was going to become popular, and mm. and um, you know I, I I take a certain mm. amount of satisfaction in knowing that we were one of the first uh, to do that, and and perhaps um, after us someone else will uh, reference it, and mm. and um, well, it was know, only it, I guess it was only I guess three years later I guess the opening is really parodied. In the uh, in the Brian De Palma's blowout, the opening of blowout, yeah. kind of a basically a parody of the opening of Halloween, uh, right? Of the of the, the played for last basically. Uh, well, and the other thing I uh, want to ask you about uh, Halloween, um, and I, I, then I want to ask you about a couple other titles, is that in uh, Halloween, I, I've I've heard from cinematographers say that uh, shooting at night in widescreen is actually very can be very difficult. Um, is that was that another challenge that you you liked to to try to that you liked meeting? Is that, is that true? Yeah, I I think so. You know, it, it, I think one of the advantages of being new at it when you you're doing something like that mm -hmm. is that you don't know what to be afraid of, right. um, and um, you, you just sort of accept uh, the the challenges uh, as opposed to being daunted by them. Um, but yes, uh, widescreen. Um, you the camera sees a lot more and and um, night night exteriors and night anything um, 
but almost almost any aspect of cinematography, the uh, you only see the things that you light. If you can't put a light on it, the film obviously won't see it or expose for it. So uh, nighttime, you have to light absolutely everything that you want to uh, the camera to see and to be in the frame and in the story. And um, with a wider frame, um, it's it's very tricky to hide the lights uh, that are lighting the areas. And that's that's one of the things that we um, I, I, I look back on now. Um, the opening shot of Halloween, um, we uh, we just sort of said, well, uh, let's see, the camera's going to be moving and seeing absolutely everything, and there's nowhere to hide lights. How are we going to do it? And we just went about uh, sort of solving it. And uh, um, now it would be something where if a uh, director said, here's what I want to do, I want to do a steady camera shot that walks and talks and does and sees the whole room and in both directions and up and down, you would say to yourself, oh, my God, this is going to be uh, very difficult uh, because you understand it. But if, uh, you know, in, in, in the early days, you just accepted the fact that, well, I, I guess we have to do that, and uh, you found ways to do it. Well, I got and I got to ask, I, I got to ask you about, I guess some would say is one of your trademarks, uh, as a cinematographer, particularly, I guess, in your work with Carpenter, and that is that that blue-tinted uh, lighting scheme in a lot of these nighttime scenes. Uh, is that is that is that your creation, or is that something Carpenter wanted, or is that something y'all came a, came um, together? No, I think well, I I think it was mostly my creation, but it's it's always hard to say because uh, John was so um, uh, collaborative that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, to say, here's what I'm going to do, and he would say, oh, well, that sounds good. And, um, you know, if it came out uh, okay, and if you saw it the next day in the dailies, um, and uh, you both liked it, you said, well, that, that worked pretty well. And if it didn't work, then you'd say, oh, well, we'll try something else. Um, but the, uh, to, the blue was something that uh, I think worked really well. It's, 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 it's a kind of, of a stylized look because, um, you know, moonlight is um, is generally not blue; it's uh, white. But because there's so little light, um, your eyes don't perceive much color at night. And so, uh, um, you know, it's it's the uh, part of your your retina that only picks up uh, luminance and not a lot of color. So, uh, humans, when they go out in moonlight, don't see much color. They see it almost in black and white. And uh, so the the trick to me was trying to find a way to to say nighttime that it wasn't a uh, a warm light a safe kind of uh, light because of a a light source or whatever but um, that you were in fact out in nighttime and um, so one way to kind of remove a lot of the warm colors uh, in the frame was to light it with blue. And to make blue the dominant color, it became a, uh, um, you know, a, a, a stylized way of, uh, of telling the audience that uh, they were out in the darkness. And uh, so it, it, um, it, I think it, it worked out well on that film, so that uh, we, John and I, sort of adopted that as our, as our, um, our nighttime, uh, scary place look. Yeah, because I mean, obviously, it's it's used, uh, it's been it's reprised in The Fog and in Escape from New York, and most uh, significantly in The Thing, uh, those that Arctic blue, basically. Uh, yes. Uh, well, and and as a cinematographer and the look of the film, how uh, how uh, how involved are you, or is it just a matter of time, a uh, matter of you know having available time? And in wanting to get like the transfers uh, of these films on first Laserdisc, but now DVD and Blu-ray, uh, how involved uh, have you gotten? I, I I've read that I, I know that the uh, the uh, Back to the Future films have been uh, are in the midst of restoration, are being restored and prepping for Blu-ray. Uh, are, are you involved in that and making sure the look is recreated properly? Um. No, you know, actually, they they haven't called me, but 
Um, I know that most of the restorations that have occurred on films that were mine, they, they've really been very faithful to, uh, I would say, the original. They, mm -hmm. they go to a, a really good print and look at it and reproduce that feeling. And um, mm -hmm. so I've been uh, relatively pleased with with the way the films have been represented and and um, have you have you seen the the Blu-ray of Halloween? Uh, are you happy with that? Or uh, that I haven't film? seen that yet. I've I've been uh, um, I, I've been a little negligent in not getting a Blu-ray machine, mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> but uh, I'm hoping uh, to do that soon. So I because uh, you know more and more films um, are, are coming out in that format and mm -hmm. and it's. A, it's a great, uh, it's a great format. It's, a, it, you know, and and I hope uh, a lot of people will, in fact, get it and it'll take over because the HD and the, um, you know, the, the the image quality that's there is so much better than what people have been seeing the films on, especially if you have only seen them on VHS or a lesser quality uh, format. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that um, you know it'll catch on quickly. I, 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 I'm always kind of uh, intrigued by the fact that if I go to a, um, for instance, the 25th anniversary um, convention uh, that was celebrating Halloween's 25th year, um, that a lot of the people who see that, and especially younger uh, audience members, they uh, they have never seen it on the screen. Uh, I recently did a, um, uh, a Back to the Future uh, screening in, in uh, Santa Monica, mm -hmm. and um, uh, the audience there uh, had was very familiar with the movie, uh, and a lot of them were younger in their teens and 20s and stuff, but they had never seen it on a screen. And they, they would come up afterwards and say, oh, my God, I... I had no idea that it looked that good or there were all of those jokes in the background, you know, <clears throat> that there were um, things that were that, that, that they missed by virtue of having only seen a film on um, VHS and maybe DVD. Right. Uh, and uh, the fact that Halloween rarely plays on the screen, uh, that most fans now have only seen it uh, on VHS or DVD. So now that it will come out in uh, in Blu-ray, um, the uh, the HD version is going to uh, be even that much better looking, and um, hopefully it's uh, one of those things that will add um, tremendously to the experience of watching it. Well, I got to ask about one of your one of my favorite titles that you've done, and I'm going to assume that it it was probably the most daunting of all the titles on your filmography, but if it isn't, you can correct me. But that is uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Um, yeah, oh, that's, you know, it's it's one of my favorite movies because um, so much of Roger Rabbit was was being done for the very first time. Um, mm -hmm. Now, we, uh, they had, they'd been putting animation and live action together for, for a long time. Disney, of course, had been doing it since the very, very silent, days uh his first ones were uh, the alice comedies and mm -hmm. um you know there was out of the inkwell max fleischer and and so forth so the the combining of animation and live action had been done for quite a while but it was always in a very sort of crude simplistic way because of the limitations of the technology and and roger rabbit <clears throat> is you know one of uh one of my proudest moments because um, we were able to to take that kind of simple technique and and do a huge leap. I mean, it 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 affected every bit of animation that appeared afterwards, even the straight uh, animation, uh, you know, the animated features, um, mm -hmm. all um, developed uh, a more dimensional feeling with tone mats on the characters that gave highlights and shadows and so forth. But uh, but Roger Rabbit was was a very, very labor-intensive, uh, meticulous uh, combining of all kinds of techniques to to produce, um, you know, the film that's there. 
How how long was that shoot? Uh, I I can't imagine. I gotta imagine it was a long shoot. Do you remember how long that shoot was? Well, I um, we we shot it in London. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in London the better part of a year with uh, prepping it, testing it, um, uh, you know, shooting it, um, doing the sort of post uh, work that I was involved with, which was. Uh, not even the animation. So uh, I I would say we we worked a good uh, solid six or seven months of actual shooting plus the uh, the, the prep and, and so forth that I did and the follow up. Um, and then they, there was a I would say the better part of a year of animation after that. Wow. Hmm. It's really remarkable. And I, I like I said I, I guess uh, I assume it was one of the most arduous shoots just because. Because I, I remember when I saw the film as a kid, the lighting, the way shadows were cast and the way the lighting was consistent in sequences where it was either going to be all animation or all live action or the combination of the two had to be consistent from literally from frame to frame. And Yeah, it, it was, it was um, you know, I, I would have to say that I was the most... Uh, completely immersed in a project uh, with that one than, than almost any other because um, every single moment uh, that is on the on the screen was very very carefully thought out choreographed the, the lighting um, was always about uh, not only just seeing the humans but um, what was going to be effective how could we mm-hmm. Uh, always do something that uh, created the illusion that the animated characters were part of the of the uh, live action world. And how do you create shadows and and little um, <clears throat> movement of set pieces and props and so forth that the animators could um, right. attach to the the animated characters and and um, always you know it was complete immersion in every shot of, of thinking about it. There was um, not no no time to really sit back and relax and cruise. Well, and then that my follow-up question is that you your the other kind of groundbreaking film that you you were a part of is a uh, is Jurassic Park. Um, and what was that what was that shoot like? Because uh, Spielberg is famous for wanting to shoot fast and you know keep on the go. Um, but I mean, yeah, well that. That was that was the, uh, the the next step. That was uh, Roger Rabbit uh, techniques um, into the new age of uh, the computer. Roger Rabbit was all pencil animation and uh, cell animation and and uh, optical printers and film, and uh, there was not a single computer involved in in any of the work. It was you know, very, very sort of classic animation. Um, but Jurassic Park was the very first time that computers uh, were used in um, combining photorealistic um, creatures with the real world. Um, and it was, once again, uh, one of those very intensive, um, constantly thinking about not only what was out in front of the camera as a live action world, but also what was going to be put in after the fact. And and as a matter of fact, we, we didn't even know when we started, uh, nor did anyone, whether this computer business was actually going to work. Uh, you know, they were, had been preparing to shoot the dinosaurs as stop motion miniatures, um, and they were going to be uh, photographed frame by frame, and uh, the, you know they actually brought uh, um, Dennis Muren from ILM, and and uh, Phil Tippett brought um, a, uh, a a little uh, rubber uh, version of the stop motion dinosaur, a T Rex, uh, to uh, the office at, uh, at Spielberg's office, and and said, okay, here's uh, here's what we've got. It's going to look like this, and so forth, and. And so we began prepping the film with the idea that we were going to be combining uh, uh, little, uh, you know, stop-motion puppets with it. And um, as we 
as we got part about halfway into the the prep and um, looking at storyboards and talking about sets and everything. One day, Dennis Muren came to uh, a, a meeting, a production meeting, and said, you know, um, we think that rather than with these uh, little rubber maquette dinosaurs, we think we're, we're going to do the uh, all of the dinosaurs in the computer with uh, computer-generated imagery, CGI. And uh, we said, oh, well, that that sounds great. And Stephen said, yeah, yeah that's, that's fabulous. Let's see what you got. And they said, well... We don't have anything. We don't even know if we can do it, but we think we might be able to. <laughs> and uh, Stephen said, well, uh, okay, why don't you show me uh, what you think? So they uh, went away and came back in about a week, and they had a very crude uh, little about five seconds worth of, of uh, video of a uh, T-Rex skeleton running. And the movement looked great, but it looked like a plastic uh, skeleton. And Stephen said, well, that, that, that certainly looks interesting. Uh, what else you got? And they said, well, well, we'll be back. And they went away, and they came back in another week, and they had a wireframe grid of the shape of the T-Rex around the skeleton running. And Stephen said, well, that's, uh, yeah, that's even more interesting. Um, what else? They said, we'll be back. So they went away and came back in another week. They had a gray skin uh of a T-Rex running, and um, it it got to look more and more interesting, but nothing that, you know, approached being photorealistic. But to Stephen's credit, he finally said, okay, I tell you what, you've made great progress. I'm going to commit to this. If you guys think you can do it, I will commit to doing it in the computer. And they said, great. So they went away and began working in earnest on uh, on getting the technique to actually work. In the meantime, we went off, <clears throat> and uh, Stephen was very, very intent on uh, making sure that we didn't run over budget, over schedule. Uh, he had been allocated 150 dinosaur shots, um, and uh, so as we would go through the storyboards and, and a sequence, <clears throat> he'd say, okay, and so then we'll do a shot of the dinosaur, and it leaps up here. How many is that? And someone would say, well, I mean, there's 152. He'd say, okay, we've got to cut out two shots. So uh, he was so intent on, on accomplishing it on time and on schedule that uh, we all were, were completely fired up with that. So as we went off and shot, we ended up uh, accomplishing the movie 12 days under schedule um, because we just moved along and, and we all – you know, sort of made it up as we went. Um, and as a matter of fact, we shot 20 out of the 30 days that had been allocated to a second unit uh, to shoot. So in other words, combining those two, we ended up uh, coming in 32 days under schedule for the movie. And, um, you know, it was it was pretty remarkable. The studio, of course, was, was uh, ecstatic about it. Um, and um, it was going to be just, you know, a kind of uh, action movie, um, popcorn entertainment for the audience. And, <clears throat> of course, when it came out, it was the first movie to break a billion dollars in box office. It was the largest box office success in the history of film. Um, you know, so it was, to us, it was the... It was a great deal of satisfaction to not only have done something that no one had ever done before, <clears throat> but to have done it uh, very sort of responsibly, under schedule, under budget, and um, and to, to do it to the success that it was the most successful film to date. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Mr. Kundi, uh, I want to thank you for your time been great hearing all about all about uh, your work as a DP. It's, you're a terrific, terrific, well, like I said, world-class cinematographer, Jurassic Park. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah. It was a great, uh, great pleasure uh, talking to you and yeah. talking to your radio yeah. audience. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, and good luck on your next project. Well, thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you.